Today I'm going to take a look at the AKG C1000S. This is the latest version in the C1000 series. It's been popular for recording instruments, vocals, and more. Now this microphone is so popular, I'm going to say it's the small diaphragm condenser microphone that wants to be an SM57. But let's check it out. Now all the audio in this review is going to be done without processing unless I tell you otherwise. So you're going to hear some background noise in my space. Keep an eye on the lower third. It's going to tell you what interface and what preamp I might be using. For the most part, it's going to be the Scarlett 8i6. I think it's a good basis of comparison, but there will be some tests done with the Universal Audio preamp as well. I also encourage you to wear headphones because you're going to get the best experience that way. I'll start up by taking a look at the mic. It does have an on-off switch as well as an LED indicator. I'll open it up. This mic has flexible power options, so we can use 9 to 52 volts or built in with batteries. Also get a couple of switches. There's a 10 dB pad as well as a bass roll off switch. I'll go ahead and throw a few batteries in here. It's, it's really simple again, just two double A's. And that's nice if you want to use this for portable recording. As you see, you just put it back together and then we're going to have battery power as an option. When I turn it on, we'll see the LED indicator. Now I'll also take the top windscreen off. And uh, when we get it off, we'll see a couple of things. First of all, there's an internal shock mount, so that's going to help with some handling noise, and then an internal foam filter. So I'll just go ahead and put that in, put the microphone back together. Now, because this is a small diaphragm condenser microphone, we know that it's meant to be used at distance. We could use it for overheads in a drum kit, or we could use it for miking up instruments. I want to do a little bit of a look here at working distance. I'm at about six inches off the microphone right now, and I'm going to back up a little bit just so you can hear how it picks up in the room. If I back up here to about a foot away from the microphone again without increasing the gain, this is kind of the sound you're going to get. The further I get away, you're definitely going to pick up a little more room noise. Back up a little further here. Now I'm at about two feet away from the microphone, and you're going to hear a lot more room noise here. Still getting pretty good signal. I see it's dropped probably about 5 dB looking at my meters, but overall it's still picking up. Now, while I'm at this distance, I also want to do what I call a fine detail test with a couple of percussion instruments. I've got a shaker here, and I encourage you to listen just for the individual granules in the shaker. Okay, and I'll also go ahead and try a kibasa here for a little bit of percussion. So hopefully that gives you an idea. The microphone certainly picks up from a distance. There's no issue like that. Right now, again, when I did that percussion test, I'm sitting at about two feet away, but the instruments were probably at about 18 inches away. So it'll give you an idea of the pickup. Now I'll move back in up to what I would consider more of a distance to use for, for spoken word. Again, I'm about six inches off the microphone here. And of course, you can see I have it a bit cross-axis, and that's to help out with plosives, so I'm not directly into the microphone. If I go directly into it, people, people, because, because, and definitely that's picking up plosives in my ears. So again, if you want to use this microphone for vocals, you probably need a pop filter, but that'll give you an idea of the working range that you can use this microphone in. Now I've gone ahead and mounted the microphone up as a boom application. So it's just out of frame, about 12 inches away from my mouth. Increase the gain here a little bit as well. So it's going to pick up more of that room noise. Definitely not intended as a boom microphone, but if you wanted to use it that way, you certainly could. This is the sound you can expect out of a fairly well-treated room. I do have an acoustic cloud in here as well as some treatment on the walls. So it's cutting down some of that reverb, but again, you are going to get some noise. So I have a few microphone comparisons for you. We're going to start out comparing directly to the AKG P170, another small diaphragm microphone. So AKG versus AKG. In terms of flexibility, we have battery power, of course, as an option here on the C1000S. We don't get that on the P170. We also have the option for that high pass filter or bass cut on the C1000S, which isn't there on the P170, but there is a pad option on both. So some, some flexibility there with both. It's really about the sound back and forth between the two and whether you think one could be more versatile or maybe one fits your need better. So this is the sound, P170 on this side, C1000S on this side. Now that you've heard both, can you tell the difference? Is this the P170 or is this a C1000S? Check that top corner to find out. Next up, we're going to compare to the Audio-Technica AT2021, a really compact small diaphragm condenser microphone. So again, you don't get the flexibility of the C1000S here, but nonetheless, this is great if you have small space or if you want to mic up an instrument, overheads, that kind of application. So 
going back and forth between the two, can you hear a lot of a difference? The, the capsule is a little bit larger on the C1000S. Is that making a difference? Overall, it's about the sound. And of course, now that you've heard both microphones, can you tell the difference? Is this the AT2021 or the C1000S? Again, check that top corner, you'll find out. And for another comparison, I've mic'd up the MXL606 here. This is a very inexpensive small diaphragm condenser. It's about a third the price of the C1000S. So kind of a beginner microphone versus something that has been used in studios for decades, but it still is an affordable price. And so this is the difference between the two microphones as they go back and forth. Again, flexibility of the power is nice to have with the C1000S, but we do have some onboard controls on the 606. And now that you've heard both microphones again, can you tell the difference? Is this the MXL or is it the AKG? Check that top corner. And for the final microphone comparison, I want to give you the Rode M3 versus the C1000S. And as you can tell, looking at the two microphones, they're really a very similar build design. The Rode has the high pass filter, just like the C1000S. We also have a pad function, gives us minus 10 or minus 20 as an option on the Rode, whereas we have only minus 10 on the AKG. Both work with battery power, so if you don't have Phantom available, you can still use these. So again, very similar in design. These two are really head to head as far as competitors go. And finally, now that you've heard both microphones, is this the Rode M3 or is it the C1000S? For one last time, check the top corner. Now I want to give you an idea of what this microphone would sound like with a little bit higher end preamp. So I've moved it over to my Universal Audio 710 to infinity. This is a variable preamp that gives us both a solid state and a tube stage. So right now it's on 100% solid state and I'll blend it all the way through to the tube so you can hear the microphone again without any other processing, just with a little different preamp. So starting out here again with 100% solid state, Moving up to now, I'm at about 25% solid state, 75% tube. Now I moved it up to about 50-50. This is a sound with kind of half tube stage for a little more saturation coming through. Now I'll go up to about 75% tube and you can really start to hear the saturation kick in. And now up to 100%, so a full tube amplifier here. And again, no other processing, just a little different flavor from a different preamp. Now looking at a logarithmic frequency comparison here of the recording made with the C1000S versus the SM57, when I said that the C1000S wants to be an SM57, I wasn't kidding. These are very, very similar frequency response graphs here. The 57 actually has maybe a little more pickup around the 7 kilohertz range, but overall I'm going to say that these microphones could be used pretty interchangeably for recording rock guitar. Let's go ahead and try blues. And I have to say, listening back, I really like the warm sound from the C1000S on blues guitar. But looking at the frequency response graphs, you can definitely see again here, there's very little difference. The 57, again, a little more brightness in that maybe 7 to 10K range. You can hear that a bit. And it also doesn't seem to have the depth. The C1000 to me had a little more depth in terms of the sound. But overall, again, interchangeable in many ways, very usable. 
Now let's check out bass guitar. Now listening back, I have to say that the test with bass actually showed the most difference from the 57 of the three tests to my ears anyways. 57 really tended to pick up more of the technique. You got more of the sound of the strings versus the, the C1000S. It was a very warm, kind of smooth sound. So, you know, you choose a microphone depending on the kind of tone that you're trying to get. But otherwise, I mean, very similar, a little more high frequency response out of the 57. Again, that 7 to 10K range perhaps. But uh, overall, again, good sound with both, matter of taste. Now the C1000 has a phantom power supply rating of 9 all the way to 52 volts, plus the built-in battery power. So I wanted to test that out. I have it connected up to my Behringer PS400 dual voltage power supply. Right now we've got that set on 48 volts, and this is what you're going to get. Now I'll switch it over to 12. Okay, and now we've moved over to 12 volts phantom power, and... You know, if you happen to have a mixer or an interface that outputs 12, 15 volts, this will give you an idea of the sound. Did it change? Is the gain any different? This is something to pay attention to here. Looking at the meter, I can't say I notice any appreciable difference in gain, so that's good to see so far. Now I'm going to go ahead and disconnect this power, and then we'll go on to battery. Okay, and so now we have only the batteries. i got a couple of fresh AA batteries in the microphone. Again, looking at the monitoring here, I don't really see a difference in gain, so it appears to be pretty much the same. The sound will have to listen back to, of course, in post, but that's a phantom power test. 48 volts, 12 volts, and battery power. Now, I'll do a couple of quick physical tests. This is not intended as a handheld microphone, but it does have a built-in shock mount. So we'll go ahead and see what kind of noise we get. And yeah, the microphone's definitely picking that up. So again, this is kind of a set it up, do your recording and tear it down. And now I've switched the internal high pass filter on so we're getting a roll off below 80 hertz. And that helped out with handling noise. Also, this gives you a chance to hear the difference in my voice with that engaged. Now another interesting thing about this microphone is that it's a cardioid microphone, but it comes with a plastic insert that you can put over top of the capsule inside that's supposed to convert that pattern to hypercardioid. It also comes with a plastic sleeve that's supposed to give you a presence boost. I don't have either of those, so I can't do those tests for you, but it is a different approach versus using electronics to get that done. So just something you should be aware of. I will check the pattern for you. This is directly in. This is 90 degrees to the microphone back around to 180 degrees from the mic and the other 90 degrees on this side. Now to me that was very interesting because I found that that was a pretty narrow cardioid pattern. It, it really, the drop off happened at 90 degrees and it didn't really change much around the back. So it was really consistent that way, but a little bit of a, what I'd call a narrow cardioid pattern. And so just something to be aware of. You're going to want to have this microphone pointing pretty much in the direction of the you know, source that you want to record. Now I want to give you an idea what this microphone would sound like with a basic voiceover plug-in chain. So I went ahead and threw Isotope's RX9 voice denoise on. That's going to get rid of that fan in the background. Then I have the RED2 EQ and RED3 compressor that come with the Scarlett interface. Again, basic EQ and compression. Not overdone here, just to give you an idea. And then the SPL dual band de -esser, my favorite hardware de -esser actually, but this is a plug-in version. And again, tone is subjective, it's what you like, but this will give you an idea of what you could do with this microphone. And because I know some of you like to use outboard gear, I've gone ahead and connected the microphone again up to the Universal Audio 710. This time I've bypassed the preamp on the ART voice channel, but I'm using hardware compression, EQ, expansion, and the de -esser. And so this will give you an idea. Of course, you can tailor the sound to what you like, but with hardware processing only, 
This is one example of the sound you can get out of the C1000S. Okay, now I'll talk a bit about the build quality. This is a very well-made microphone. Everything's really solid here, solid housing. The mesh does not move. There's no give at all on either side. So really well-made. The switch, definitely can hear it turning off and on, but it's also very solid, very positive feel. So no issues there. XLR connection again, really solid on the back. So build quality, first rate. Now I have a complete set of features and specifications in the description below, so I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on that, but I'll just draw your attention to the equivalent noise at 21 dB. That's rather high, but I have to say the microphone doesn't sound like that. To me, it sounds like it has a lot less noise than that. Again, specs are only specs, just something to be aware of, but I would say overall the microphone performs at least as well as the specs would have us believe. So now that we've had a chance to hear this microphone and see some tests, let me give you my final thoughts. This is a very versatile microphone. When I said up front, this could be the SM57 of small diaphragm condensers. I wasn't kidding. It's really useful on a lot of sources. You could do spoken word, vocals, you could do instruments, amp cabinets, really anything you want with this microphone. If you don't have something like that in your mic locker, this would be a good one to look at for that all around use case, especially if you have a home or project studio. But this has been popular and been used in really pro studios for decades now. So you're getting that AKG quality. Everything here is as it should be for this price point and even much higher. But of course, there are a lot of alternatives with microphones. So you might want to check out my review of the Rode M3 or the comparison of the SM57 versus the P170.